You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is episode 46, and this is Brian McClanahan, your host. And this episode covers the week of October 10th through October 14th, 2016. Glad to have you back on the program. Uh, Before we get started with our material this week, and we had uh, a a very interesting week with the material, I'd like to mention again that uh, we exist on your generous contributions alone. If you like this podcast, share it on social media, but not only that, please make a generous contribution to the Abbeville Institute. You can find all that material on our website, www.abbevilleinstitute.org, and click at the top where it says support, and then memberships for individuals. Uh, You can help us keep this podcast going, help keep the website going. Uh, help us in our pursuit to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. And, of course, we've got some other goodies coming up in the year of 2017. We're wrapping up 2016 pretty quickly, and uh, we've almost had one year of podcasts now. In uh, six weeks, we'll have had 52 podcasts, so one a week, uh, with the exception of one week uh, uh, back in July. But uh, we're, we're looking forward to continuing this process out, but, again, we need your help. That said, also please like us on Facebook. Please like us, follow us on Twitter. Please uh, follow our YouTube page and share our material. This is how we ensure that the Southern tradition can be maintained for future generations. And that, of course, is our ultimate mission, to make sure that the Jeffersonian political tradition does not die, to ensure that the, uh, that the valuable parts of the Southern tradition do not die, and future generations can enjoy them as you are enjoying them now and as... Uh, uh, your previous generations enjoyed them. Okay, so let's talk about the material for this week. Uh, on Monday, we ran a piece, uh, the third part of the series, Reestablishing the Family Economy, a Biblical Imperative by Herrick Kimball. And um, there's four parts to this particular series, so we'll have one more part in this. But this particular essay was devoted to Phil Robertson of Duck Dynasty fame. And uh, he said that he had never seen this show, but then his son wanted the book, so he went out and um, he started listening to some of the television shows. And I know that there are some issues with Phil Robertson and some things that he believes in terms of the Southern tradition and Southern symbols in particular. But he does exemplify the independent spirit that Jeffersonian agrarianism needs to, uh, to uh, exist, right? So in order for some of the things we're talking about to happen, to, to, to be uh, possible, you need to have independent people. And we've talked about that quite a bit on this, pro- on this podcast and on the website but one thing Robertson has, of course, the entire uh, Duck Commander brand is a family industry. This is in, and so what Herrick Kimball says is this is exactly what people should be trying to do. Have your family business. They started in a shed in their backyard, and everyone helped. The, the parents helped, and the kids helped. Everyone was part of this process in making Duck Commander a multi-million dollar industry. And the family is very close. They have the family meal all the time. The families. Uh, always get together, the the, uh, the brothers, and then, of course, all the kids. So, And they're always around each other. And I think that's one valuable lesson you can take away from the Duck Dynasty brand is that. And also that you have a very strong patriarch in that family. Uh, Phil Robertson uh, is the leader of that family. And, of course, his father was also very important to him. And there is a story about Phil Robertson that probably a lot of people have heard, but the essay doesn't get into and that is that Phil Robertson was an excellent football player. He played quarterback. He actually started over Terry Bradshaw in college. But he wanted to do he wanted to hunt. He wanted to make duck calls. And he saw that as his way to the future and so he gave up football to go do that. And uh you know uh, Terry Bradshaw from Louisiana also would talk about how he would come in smelling like uh he had just been out in the swamps and uh he had had you know blood all over him from hunting and he, uh, he just didn't look like, uh, you know, your prototypical college athlete. Uh, and, of course, Terry Bradshaw goes on to win four Super Bowls with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And, uh, but he was not as good as, as Phil Robertson when he was in college. So here's a guy that gave up that type of opportunity to go have a family business. Now, granted, a multi-million dollar family business, but a family business nevertheless, and one that was grounded in his principles and beliefs. And so he didn't want to go on to that that uh, siren of fame and fortune. He wanted to stay home and do what he did best. And, of course, that later became Duck Commander. Um, Now, one of the other things that, of course, this emphasizes, as I mentioned before, is independence. Phil Robertson has been able to say things that are controversial because he doesn't need anyone 
uh, to give him money. I mean, right, so you're going to buy his duck calls, but people are going to do that anyways. And as he makes statements, more and more people will say, well, I like what Phil Robertson is saying. I'm going to go buy more of his duck calls. Uh, but he's not beholden to a company, a uh, you know, corporate uh, entity in America to give him a paycheck. He just lives on the land. Uh, there was an individual I used to work with who had this exact same idea. He actually taught business, and uh, he was hired in at the institution where I work, and then there were some, some issues, and he left. But I remember before he did, he told me, he said, you know what, um, if, if this doesn't work out, I'm okay with that because I have my farm. Uh, he raised cattle on his own farm. He built his house by himself. He wasn't married. Uh, he was uh, in his uh, late 40s, early 50s when he worked there. And so he, he, uh, had this, he had this independent spirit. He could say what he wanted and do what he wanted because he didn't really need the job. He just went home. So having a paycheck was nice, but it wasn't necessary. And that's the kind of independence that I think we're missing in America today. People are so beholden to someone to give them money, whether it's in the political class. If you look what's happening with our politicians, they are politicians. They have to shake hands and kiss babies and all the other things and then hopefully get, some, get their palms greased so they can make decisions. This reflects this, this lack of independence is problematic for the entire American system. And I think that's something we don't think about. This is why, for example, you know, Donald Trump has been popular in, in, for a lot of people because he says he doesn't need that type of influence. And so I think that's something that's very important. It's an independent spirit that's missing in America that was very much part of the Southern tradition, the Jeffersonian tradition. It is part of agrarianism. If you have that independence, you're beholden to no one, and you can make better decisions for yourself and better political decisions as well. So the faster you can become independent in whatever way, and this is all that Herrick Kimball is saying. Now, he would, he would advocate going and living off the land. But if you can't do that, uh, the faster you can become independent, debt-free, or uh, you know, being independent in your working environment, whatever that is, the better you're going to be as a citizen. So this is part of the Jeffersonian principles, you know, an independent yeomanry uh, who can make good decisions for the future because they're not beholden to anyone for a paycheck or a handout. Uh, they can just exist on their own. And, and survive and thrive on their own, too. And so it does take a special kind of individual. Dependent people by nature will never be that way. But the independent people can lead the way. And so this is something that we're, you know this essay, this series, has been trying to hammer home. And Kimball uh, says at the end, I declare America needs more men like Phil Robertson. And Phil Robertson is, of course, a product of the South. And so this is where the Southern tradition, people say, oh, I mean, we had, uh, had somebody email me the other day, on our on the Facebook account, oh yeah, what's the Southern tradition? Poverty. Uh, Y'all are just a bunch of dependent people down there sucking off the federal government. Uh, and I mean, there is some truth to that in that uh, you know the Southerners uh, do receive more social services than uh, virtually any other part of the country, excluding uh, your high uh, at this point illegal immigrant populations. But uh, this is also because of the poverty that has been. Uh, foisted on the South after the war. So the South was a very wealthy section before the war and then paid reparations extensively uh, after the war, maybe not directly, but through pensions and other things. So the North impoverished the South. This is a byproduct of Reconstruction. And it's that lack of independence and the fact that Southerners, the next piece I'm going to talk about, uh, eagerly tried to be accepted back in the North where they abandoned some of the principles that had made them great for so long, and it was that independence, uh, and so I think that's something we need to think about moving forward. You know, when you talk to people about the Southern tradition, you can talk about, well, you know what, the Southern tradition, the 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 old Southern tradition was independence. It was people who could make decisions because they were beholden to no one. They just went home. They didn't need anything else. They weren't beholden to some stockbroker, uh, you know, uh, some uh, some paper jobber. They had land and they had independence. And that's what made them different and unique. And so when you get into the piece on uh, Tuesday, which was actually an old piece from 1908 written by Tom Watson, who was a United States senator from Georgia, among other things. Uh, he was a leader of the populist movement. And uh, this particular piece is interesting because you could have written this piece in 2016. In fact, the conclusion is, is so good. He says this, quote, 
Uh, both the old parties are now hopelessly Hamiltonian. It remains to be seen whether we shall have a party of Jeffersonians in 1908 or whether we shall have one more final performance, or I'm sorry, I should say farewell performance of the Twins. So what he's saying in 1908 is that the Democrat Party and the Republican Party are the same party. Now, this theme has been picked up, and of course, Watson's going after them in terms of big business. They have both accepted a liberal construction of the Constitution. They have both accepted uh, the, the old Hamiltonian economic system. They had adopted that by 1908. And I think uh, that's very much true in 1908. Now, the last time you could say that there was maybe a more Jeffersonian candidate running for the Democrats was in 1904, when you had Alton Parker nominated by the Democrat Party. But that was it. Since then, you've had uh, Democrats who are very much uh, in line with the Hamiltonian system, and as the Republicans are too. We really don't have an opposition party anymore that's interested in independence in a real economy, not one that's not propped up by the state. You don't have it. And so he makes a nice, uh, ex a nice uh, does a nice little history lesson here about how this happened. And he brings up the 1840 Democrat Party platform when it said, uh, Congress has no power to charter a U.S. bank. We believe such an institution, one of deadly hostility to the best interests of the country, dangerous to our Republican institutions, and the liberties of the people, and calculated to place the business of the country within the control of a concentrated money power and above the laws and the will of the people. This is from 1840. And, of course, we've deviated so far from that. And he says the Democratic Party today occupies opposite ground at every point to that held by the old Democrat Party of 1840. It favors national banks. It favors the fostering of one branch of industry to the detriment of the other. It sanctions a liberal construction of the Constitution. It sanctions internal improvements. And every party, both parties do that now. We really don't have an opposition party. And this is something that I think, if we're looking for political solutions, of course, I've advocated on this podcast and my own podcast that one of the things we need to do is think locally and act locally. You need to concentrate on hearth and home first and then move up to your community and then to your state. If you can just make that better, your entire life will be better. Now, we can't control foreign policy from that area, and, of course, uh, we've got all kinds of problems there. But we can control our own environment to, to a great extent and to how we interact in our own environment. So I think that what, what we're missing in everything is that local component that makes all of this work. And that is the key to everything. And, of course, recognizing ultimately that we really don't have a party that's interested in, in uh, the Southern tradition or true Southern values, which is independence. We don't have that anymore. So we can vote Republican if you want to in national elections, quote-unquote national elections. Uh, you can vote you know, however you want to vote there. Uh, and you know, this is, uh, this is not a political movement here at the Abbeville Institute. Our job is to point out what we could bring to the table from the Southern tradition that might make things better, ultimately, not just for the South, but for America as a whole. Uh, somebody also criticized uh, something that we said, you know, the South is America. Well, you can't say that because you're just, you're weakening your position. Not really. I mean, we've pointed this out in our principles, how, how much the South influenced America at the founding up until 1861. Even then, Lincoln was born in, in Kentucky. And so there, have been, there were Southerners back in the, in the uh, post-Bellum period that said, well, you know, if it wasn't for the South, the, the Union wouldn't have won the war. Lincoln's a Southerner. All their greatest generals were Southerners. Uh, they weren't Northerners uh, for the most part. So, I mean, th this is something that uh, you know, people miss. And then moving into the 20th century, the South has been the backbone of just about everything that's happened in America that's been positive for America. We forget that our own peril. We focus too much on the negative of the South, the perceived negative of the South today, and we don't focus enough on what the South actually brings to the table, which is the American spirit. So uh, I think that um, one thing we can get out of this is that uh, there isn't a party that represents, a political party that really represents the Southern tradition or, more importantly, the Jeffersonian tradition, of strict construction like taxes, you know, anti-imperialism, uh, these type of things. You know, the resisting a fusion of banking and finance and government, uh, which we don't have. So uh, we, we do have that, but we don't have a party that represents 
the opposition to that. So uh, this is something that I hope if you read this piece, you, you, you see that. Uh, Wednesday, we had a piece, uh, an older piece by Clyde Wilson, uh, a review of, uh, of um, Reinventing the South um, by Mark, the late Mark Winchell. Uh, he's, he's now been dead for a little while, but uh, this uh, review was uh, written, written uh, oh, about four or five years ago, I think. And uh, he talks about how Winchell was such a great writer, uh, particularly in writing about the agrarians. And that was his focus most of his life, was writing about people like Davidson and Brooks and uh, Robert Penn Warren and John Gould Fletcher. But he also talks about William Faulkner and Tennessee Williams and Cormac McCarthy. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a collection of essays on their influence on the Southern tradition and what it means to be a Southerner in the 20th century. And that 20th century South is something that's so neglected, it is not discussed enough. And the influence of the South, the, the positive influence the South had for 20th century America. We talk about the antebellum South, the early Federal Republic, uh, when you had uh, you know people like Jefferson and Madison and Monroe and Washington and all the great Southerners there. But we don't focus enough on the 20th century South uh, and what contributions it made to positive elements of Southern society and, and of course, American society. Uh, you know, one thing, there's a, a book by uh, Bill Kaufman, uh, Ain't My America, and he brings up some of these Southern anti-imperialists there. Now, they were in the minority. There's no doubt the South has been much more martial than the rest of the United States, particularly in the 20th century, uh, also in the 19th century as well. But uh, there were Southerners who were concerned about the influence of foreign policy destroying the Federal Republic. And uh, one of those is Claude Kitchen from North Carolina, who cast a vote against the, uh, the U.S. involvement in World War I. But there were others. And uh, this, is, this is an important part of the South to get out. Of course, we often look at that uh, Wilson period, Wilson presidency, and the South was very influential in that presidency. And some of the things we look at and we say, well, that was, you know, maybe we don't like that. Um, no, it was, you know, the, the uh, Glass-Steagall uh, bill that uh, regulated banking. Uh, there was the, uh, there was uh, a tariff, the Underwood Tariff, uh, the Clayton Antitrust Act. I mean, all those things were influenced by the South. And what I've often said about that period, and I wrote about this in my uh, Nine Presidents Who Screwed Up America, is that the South was using the apparatus they were given to get back at the New England and Northeastern merchants who they thought had screwed up the United States. And uh, that was important to them. They were just using the things they were given to do it. And so you look at that Antitrust Act. You look at the Glass-Steagall bill. You look at the Underwood tariff. It was a tariff reduction. You look at those things, and you see very much an old, old line uh, interest in real Jeffersonian principles, but using the government to do it. So they were interested in a liberal construction of the Constitution because that is what had been left to them, and they were going to use it against the Northeastern merchants the best that they could. Um, so I think that's something that's often lost in that period. And, of course, we focus far too much on uh, domestic concerns in the South and uh, the opinion of those, and we don't look enough at how these individuals were using a Jeffersonian model to attack Ameri American finance, uh, a fusion of American banking, finance, and government. Uh, and they're trying to break that apart. And that's an interesting part of the, of the New South and, of course, the 20th century. Now, uh, Thursday, we ran a piece uh, entitled Nullification or Secession. And this is written by uh, John Marquardt from, uh, actually, uh, Jack lives in Japan. So this is, uh, he sends me stuff every now and then. And, uh, and Jack is, um, gosh, he, was, he, was, he served in World War II. So um, he's, uh, he's a young fellow, and uh, he, he's still interested in, in uh, sending stuff about the Southern tradition, and we enjoy his contributions. But he's not very much in favor of nullification. And I uh, sent us a piece, and I said, well, you know, this kind of goes against uh, what, what we advocate here at the Institute. So then he, he redid it, and he said, well, what about this? Because this is actually what I firmly believe in, that there, you know, nullification may not work, uh, but there is the ultimate hammer, which is secession. And so, you know, why aren't we talking about that? And, of course, the Institute is interested in that idea. We're interested in all ideas from the Jeffersonian tradition, whether it's nullification, decentralization, secession, whatever it is, to help arrest the monster in Washington, D.C. And he points out, you know, maybe uh, nullification is the answer. Maybe 
He says here, the original roadmap to regional independence and possible salvation is still valid, which is secession. Contrary to what might be thought as conventional wisdom today, as stated at the outset, there never was, and there still is, no actual section of the U.S. Constitution that would preclude states from putting referendums for or against secession on the ballot, and if duly approved, for such states than an attempt to legally depart from the Union or to form a new regional grouping. That being said, it is certain that today's federal government would not allow such moves to proceed unchallenged and would at least lay the matter before the Supreme Court. He says that should have been the case in 1860. On the other hand, it is also entirely possible that the government would, es would eschew any legal action, and if it orders the states to cease and desist, we ag were ignored, once again set itself immediately upon Lincoln's tragic road to war. In either instance, however, given the gravity of today's ever-growing national dilemma, referendums on secession might be worth a try. For as Donald Trump has said during his campaign, what do you have to lose? And this is something I think is going to be explored. The Brexit situation, we've talked about secession here, we've talked about political independence um, we'll see what happens. I mean, but people, there is one key to this, and I think that goes back to Monday. People need to be independent. They need to make these decisions because I've seen it several times. Well, I mean, I'm all for this, but what about my check? What about my retirement check or my Social Security check? What about uh, my Medicaid or Medicare? Uh, what about my social services? Whatever it is. So these are issues that would have to be dealt with. People are dependent on the federal government. So the key is to becoming independent of the federal government. And therefore, you have a much more likely uh, case for independence. I mean, one thing that Brexit had was that, you know, it never tied into the euro. And even though you had people tied into the European economy, there still was a tremendous amount of independent spirit in Britain for its own destiny. And I think that's why it was able to work. And one of the reasons why Scotland independence didn't work is because people were scared about what would happen to Scotland if they broke away from, from uh, Great Britain. And so you have that here in the United States. I don't think people are ready for this idea yet at all. Uh, people are still very much dependent. Uh, and so a secession is you know, something that might be further down the road, way down the road, in fact. People have to start accepting independence for themselves before they can even go after a political movement, which is why, in my opinion, some of the other possibilities that work better, you know, nullification, uh, decentralization, some of these things, because people just aren't ready for the, for the uh, upheaval that will come in an independence movement. I mean, there's no doubt about it. There's going to be some transitionary problems in that process, should it ever happen. Uh, you saw it in 1861. Uh, even take away the war, there still was some kind of, there was a little bit of disruption. Now, if the cotton had been blocked and other things, maybe there wouldn't have been that much. But uh, the South has a very large, and we've talked about this on the program, what an independent South would look like. Very large and vibrant economy. So these are ideas that uh, you know, we need to be thinking about uh, as we move forward. No matter who wins the presidential election or um, you know, what the future of the United States Congress looks like, the, the point is that you have to start thinking for yourself, independence, locally, your own community, uh, your own household, and then you can work out from there. You've got to be independent. You've got to do what Kimball is doing and have an independent family economy. You've got to try to work with that. And so that's the ultimate goal for people, and it's hard work. It, take, it takes a lot of it. But uh, if you can come up with something in your own life that's going to help your family outside of your, of your 9 to 5 paycheck, uh, that would be beneficial for you in the future. All right, so all those uh, things that we just talked about, all that stuff that's uh, – you know, very, uh, there's a lot of gravity to that. And uh, so we, we finish off the week with a little bit of Southern humor. And this little piece was written also in 1908, in fact, by a woman named Mary Washington. And she was talking about some other Southern humor, humorists. But uh, she brought up uh, a person that she thought was a great humorist, but he didn't get any credit for that. And that was uh, Bishop Richard Wilmer, um, who was the, uh, I think, the Archbishop of uh, Alabama at one point. And, but he was born in Virginia. Uh, and so he used to tell great stories. And I think that's something that's lost in people when they think about church. Uh, some of the funniest people I've ever met are ministers, priests, ministers. They have, an, they have an interesting humor about them because of how they think about life. And we, we always think that Christianity is very serious. I mean, I think people on the outside looking in that aren't, that aren't Christians or don't go to church, I think this is a very grave and serious thing. But for the most part, what I've ever experienced is that, you know, there is that part of it. I mean, there is a, there is a, there is a serious 
determination and worship. But there's also these, these men who see the highs and lows of life and who understand it well. They also see the humor in things. Um, uh, and, and I think that's something we forget at our own peril, how human Christianity really is. And so Bishop Wilmer um, uh, told stories, and he, he, there's a couple of these little anecdotes here. And she says, um, In a certain parish where he officiated in his early clerical life, there was a lady whose table was loaded with the richest food, and who was notorious for being a gourmand. From overindulgence, she had contracted a serious form of indigestion, one which, in addition to its physical ills, oppressed her spirits with deep gloom, especially in regard to her spiritual condition. In one of these spells of indigestion and consequent gloom, she told Mr. Wilmer she felt as if she were possessed by evil spirits, like the people at, our, at the time of our Lord's advent. Ah, madam, replied he, this can go forth by nothing but prayer, but by prayer and fasting. So telling her you're eating too much, in a very polite way. Stop stuff in your face. And then he told a story. A gentleman of his acquaintance, having lost his wife, erected over her remains a tombstone bearing the legend, The light of my life has gone out. A couple of years later, when the disconsolate widow had married a second time, Bishop Wilmer remarked on passing the tomb and reading the inscription, Well, he has struck a match again. And finally, uh, there was a little uh, wit from uh, a nephew of uh, Bishop Wilmer's, a man named uh, C. Breckenridge Wilmer, who lived in Atlanta, Georgia at the time. And this is his quote on Virginians. And Don Livingston said this is, this is also true of South Carolinians as well, but this is it. That the mischief with Virginians is that they think they are, that if they are born Virginians, they need not be born again. Which, uh, well, if you are born in Virginia, you're born in the greatest state uh, in, in the country. And uh, only so few of us are privileged to be a born, to be a born in Virginia. So... Um, great little anecdotes there, and so leaving the week on a light note, and uh, we uh, we try to do that every now and then to uh, not make it so serious and gloomy. The Southern tradition has a lot to offer, and humor is one of those things. Uh, Southerners are better at making jokes than just about anyone else, and good jokes too. Very very nice, uh, clean jokes. So uh, that said, we hope you enjoyed this week of the uh, of the Abbeville Institute. Again, follow us on Facebook, uh, on Twitter. YouTube, please make a contribution if you like this podcast and the things we do. Until next time, good day.